This episode of Hello PhD is sponsored by Promega and listeners like you. Thanks for your support. She virtually wrote the book on it. She virtually did, and I virtually spoke to her about it. I think more people have read this document than probably anything I have ever written or will ever write. Welcome to Hello PhD, a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. This week, tips for defending your dissertation at a safe distance during a pandemic. Stay with us. And we're back. This is Hello PhD, episode 131. I'm Joshua Hall. And I'm Daniel Arneman. And we'll discuss the human side of science and life in the lab. Hey, Dan, welcome back to the show. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. <laughs> Josh, hopefully you're staying safe. I, I know I am. And, you know, we're socially distanced right now, and that makes the ethanol section twice as much fun. What do you have for us? The official beer of the pandemic for my house is going back to an old favorite. This is from New Belgium Brewery. Not the Is that a country, New Belgium? Belgium is a country. <laughs> Uh, from New Belgium Brewing, this is the Citradelic Tangerine IPA. This is one I've enjoyed for a long time. I think we've even had it on the show, but I'm not sure what episode. But that's what I'm drinking right now, Dan. Fruity, nice uh, orangey IPA. Loving it. It occurs to me, I haven't been out of the house in a while. Maybe New Belgium is a country now. It's tough to say. <laughs> it's hard to say. What are you drinking, Dan? You got something different. You mentioned that you have been uh, enjoying some wine lately, and you've been going to a, a nice local bottle shop to try and keep them in business. I live in rural North Carolina, and what we have is Walmart. And so I needed to get a white wine. We were going to have risotto, and you need to put white wine in risotto. And the store shelves are still pretty picked over. So I came home with a box of a Chardonnay from a, uh, a vineyard called Estancia. And I'll just go ahead and say it is not my favorite, uh, <laughs> but now I have a full box of it. The best wine is the wine that they have. <laughs> that turns out to be the case. Dan, I've been probably like a lot of people doing my best to keep things as entertaining as possible from the confines of my own home over the weekend. I think I might have mentioned on the show back in January, my family and I took a vacation to Disney World. Uh, those were Those were different times. Just in time. You know, actually, we went back and forth between going in January and over my kids' spring break, which would have been last week. I think we chose well on that decision. But one of the things we did on Saturday night was we connected the phone to the TV and we brought up all the photos and did our best of reliving the Disney World vacation from our living room, including uh, when we got to the rides. I pulled up YouTube videos of first-person ride throughs of the roller coasters and splash mountain and, and that was surprisingly fun that's what we're doing for fun now these weren't your videos i hope no 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 you didn't have your uh, cell phone out on a no this was just on going on youtube but searching splash mountain or expedition everest or whatever and you've got along. a pretty good you've got a pretty good tv set up and a couch right in front of it i feel like you could have a an experience first person viewing that it was pretty fun we threw our hands up in the air for the big drops you know it was uh it was pretty good no, just plug the, the coaxial cable into my brainstem. That's really what I need. <laughs> what have you been doing to stay sane, Dan? Uh, I'm in the garden every day, which is fantastic. And it's changing a lot and it's beautiful out. And I feel like in the next few weeks, it's going to get too hot and too mosquito-y. So I'm trying to take every moment I can out there. Gosh, this weather has been so phenomenal. And I'm realizing this is probably the most that I have enjoyed and noticed spring and the changing of the season for, for many years, just sort of watching the leaves slowly start to come in and now becoming more full. I don't think I've ever taken the time or had the opportunity to really slow down and witness that. So maybe that's a little bit of a silver lining. Yeah, we, uh, I think we have a lot that, you know, everybody in, in the family is healthy. And I think we have a lot to be thankful for, for that and for the, some of the experiences we're having together. Um, one of the other things, Josh, that you and I are thankful for that uh, occurred to us today as we're recording is uh, because of our, our patrons and because of our sponsorship, we have a second recording setup that I have at my house. And so we can safely talk to each other. I've been uh, recording interviews with other people. Um, so we've got some great interviews coming up on the on the books already. 
And that's because of the generosity of patrons and, and some of our sponsors. So I think we have a new Patreon patron this week, don't we? We sure do. I wanted to give a special thanks to Anthony, who joined our growing list of Patreon supporters. So thanks, Anthony. And we don't want to forget to mention Promega. Um, Promega is doing quite a bit of work right now trying to support the COVID-19 response. They are providing tests and tools and reagents and therapeutics uh, to help fight that disease. You can find out more about that by going to promega.com slash hellophd. And it's it's a really exciting story about how a company is on the front lines of, of helping to basically fight against this pandemic. All right, Dan, you ready to get into our topic of the week? Always ready. In our last episode, we talked to some different folks, some faculty, some students about the different ways that COVID-19 and this pandemic situation is impacting labs and research. And, and really, you know, two weeks ago, even though that's not that long a period of time, that felt like the early days. <laughs> I feel like now we're settling in a little bit to this new normal. It's changing so fast. But you know, Dan, uh, one particular group of trainees that I believe this time period could be especially stressful for are those senior graduate students who had their thesis defenses scheduled for the spring. And that's, that's a lot of different people. And over the last few weeks, I've actually had the opportunity to attend several uh, PhD defenses given via Zoom or some other means of a video conference. And I'm sure for most of these folks, you know, Dan, if you can remember how long you pine for that day that you're going to defend that thesis and what that's going to look like. You kind of imagine inviting your family and having your committee there and your friends from the department all sitting there in a room together. And COVID-19 is totally changing that. That's not possible at all. You know, what occurs to me, Josh, is there is nothing that would have stood between me and (laughs) defending that dissertation just to be done with it. Because you, you have prepared so long and so much to, to do a presentation, whether it's a public defense or a private one, you have read every paper and you're holding it all in your mind, trying to just keep it in to get through that one hour or four hours or whatever length of time it is for your department. And I, I think to, to not have that would be unimaginable. And so I, it's amazing to me that people are finding creative ways to do this age old process, but in a very modern way. Absolutely. And and I would say this is unprecedented. You could probably say the number of graduate students defending their thesis virtually, there's probably been more in the last three weeks than in history combined up till this point. Would you say that's true? Absolutely. Um, All right, Dan. So today we are going to share an interview that I did with Ashton Merck. And Ashton is a recent PhD in history uh, from Duke University, and she's a history PhD, but she studied a few things that I think overlap with with maybe a lot of our listeners and things we're interested in. She studied food safety regulation, international trade, and something uh, called chlorinated chicken. Dan, are you familiar with chlorinated chicken? I am not very familiar with chlorinated chicken. <laughs> Is that like chicken in a pool? Tell me more. But anyway, the reason I reached out to Ashton, partly because she is one of the growing group of graduate students who have defended their thesis via video conference. But beyond that, she took the time to write up her experiences into this really thorough document that she put on Google Docs. And it is titled Defending a Dissertation by Video Conference. And she goes into all the details of considerations that she had, things she thought about, lessons learned, and really practical tips for graduate students who are defending their dissertation by Zoom or some other online tool. So I thought she'd be a great person to talk to, Dan. She virtually wrote the book on it. She virtually did, and I virtually spoke to her about it. All right. Well, let's hear that interview, Josh. My name is Ashton Merck, and I am a historian of business and public policy at Duke University. I'm also trained in the history of public health. So um, this has been an interesting time for me. I'm reminded of all my fields readings. Um, And I wrote my dissertation on food safety regulation and international trade. And so I'm engaged with history, but I'm also read pretty widely across social sciences. And I actually have to know, I know this is a podcast mostly for scientists. So I actually have to know and read some of the scientific literature on food safety and food science in order to do my research. 
In terms of what I do, I think uh, I help other researchers sort of understand the historical dimensions of laws and regulations. So kind of how they came to be, why they are the way they are, uh, which I think is a necessary starting point if you're going to talk about policy reform or recommendations. So and I de- and I defended my dissertation on March 24th. Congratulations, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it doesn't really feel like it really happened, but... No, that's really fantastic. And like I said, congratulations on defending your uh, thesis and being minted a new PhD. That's a huge accomplishment. That's a huge accomplishment anyway, um, even more so in the midst of a global pandemic. So (laughs) great job. So one of the reasons we wanted to talk to you today, Ashton, was like a lot of other grad students right now who are nearing the finish line with their PhD, you had to defend your thesis in a non-conventional manner, you had to do it via Zoom or uh, teleconferencing. So tell us a little bit about what that was like. And I think what I want to know, we're going to get into just the nuts and bolts of the best practices Mm -hmm. for defending that way. But was there, what what was that like emotionally? I imagine you have envisioned what your defense would be like for quite some time. And the way it ended up happening, I would imagine was quite different than how you probably imagined it a year ago or even six months ago or maybe three months ago. So tell us a little bit about what that change of plans was like from an emotional level. Yeah. And I think the change of plans happened on a much shorter time scale, even because I filed the, you know, the initial filing for the committee review on March 9th. So, I mean, I filed my dissertation thinking that I was going to defend in person. So, so really two or three weeks before your defense. Yeah, it's about two. We have to you have to file two weeks in advance. So in that two weeks between turning in my dissertation and defending, like it sort of felt like everything fell apart in that amount of time. And so, um, and it very quickly became clear that this was not a choice to be made. That this was no longer going to be possible. It was just so yeah. It was just so weird too because I really didn't even get to celebrate like turning it in or. Like we didn't really go out because it was like a Monday and, you know, I just like ran some errands that I've been putting off for a couple of months. I like filed my taxes, got my oil, you know, I did like really boring stuff because I was like, oh, it's the middle of the week. We'll celebrate the weekend. And then like by the weekend, it was clear that things had gone horribly, horribly wrong. And I'm already, I'm already an extrovert. So I was already kind of poorly adapted to the self-enforced social <laughs> And so I really missed sort of some of the simple things like, you know, getting to go out with my friends afterward, my colleagues rather afterward, or, you know, just that experience of like, you know, you shake your advisor's hand and they sort of call you Dr. Merck or something like that. Yeah. And so, and so that's something that normally would happen in your, your discipline is, you know, certainly you would go out with, with maybe friends, fellow students in the program, your colleagues in the department to have some beers or have a celebratory dinner or something like that. That would have been a typical response to you graduating. Yeah. And it's also would have been typical of everyone else. And, you know, it's kind of like, it's about, it was a defense season, if you will. So there were lots of students who were defending their, they were doing their preliminary exams and other students who were defending in the same week as me. So under normal circumstances, there would have been, you know, three, four different kind of outings to celebrate each person individually. And so it's been weird to do none of those. So it sounds like I'm hearing you say a little bit, it was anticlimactic. So you, you did the thing yeah. and it was over and then you're still sitting at your house. <laughs> yeah, and, still well, that house. happened. <laughs> okay. Now what? I guess I'll watch Netflix. Yeah. I, yeah. Actually, that is basically what happened. <laughs> The virtual. So, I mean, that was the thing because I had talked to some colleagues who had defended the last couple years and I was asking them kind of, you know, before, again, before March 9th, asking them sort of like what to expect from it, what the experience was like. And they told me, you know, even having done it in person under normal circumstances, that it was kind of anticlimactic. And so I was a little bit prepared for that. But I do think that the virtualization element just amplified that. A bit. I think it was like raining the night of my defense too, so I couldn't even like really go on a walk afterward or something. So no, I mean it wasn't sad. It was just I do feel like I've kind of deferred that sense of celebration to some future date. Yeah. Which maybe I don't know how healthy that is, but that's what I'm doing. So if we we go back and think about your actual experience while you were defending 
your thesis. First, tell us a little bit about what that process is normally like for your your field and your department. And then what was it actually like to do it virtually versus in person? Did, were there things that were better about the way you did it, things that were worse? Was it awkward? Um, so just sort of walk us through the actual time that you spent doing your defense. Sure. Yeah, so I should note that I've been to at least one uh, defense in the sciences. And so I know the history of defenses are quite different in that um, there's not a public presentation component to it. Your parents usually don't come to your defense in history. It's actually, it's sort of the last time you really get your whole committee in a room together to talk about your work. And that's the whole purpose is to talk about your work. Um, So, you know, I say a few words at the beginning or the the person defending says a few words at the beginning, but it's mostly a conversation between the candidate and the committee. And it's usually a conversation about how to turn the dissertation into a book. Uh, And so this is a fairly private conversation. You'll often see a couple of note takers, maybe somebody who works with the same faculty member, and that way they can kind of get a sense of, you know, what that faculty member is like in the setting or something. Uh, So, but usually there's maybe like three people or four people observing, and typically people will wait outside at the end, your friends will wait outside at the end. And so then when the committee is deliberating, they sort of kick you out of the room and you're sort of wait with them. So that's that's the social component is sort of outside. So that's sort of, that whole dynamic was very weird because it happened through like a Zoom breakout room. But at the same time, because it was virtual, uh, I got to have quite more observers than is typical because, you know, it's very easy to just hide those people. And so you don't have, like in, a, in an in-person version of this, if you have too many observers, it, it feels <laughs> like you have a in a way that it normally wouldn't. Oh, I see. So you, so you were actually able to, there were not necessarily rules against having people observe. So you, you might have had a few people who were kind of watching this conversation, even, even though typically it might have just been you and your committee behind closed doors. Yeah, and it's not so much that it's behind closed doors. It's just like not typical to have a big audience. I see. Uh, like, it's, like it's much more typical in the sciences because this is really, it's almost more about like, you reaching like equal footing with your committee or something. And so like, for example, two of my former uh, students who are undergrads uh, had wanted to like crash the defense or at least like show up at the end. (laughs) And I just let them observe the defense because they expressed interest Mm -hmm. and I figured benefit from it. And their, but their presence in an in-person defense, the the committee might've found that off-putting. They'd been like, what are they doing here? Um, but it didn't. Har- it was kind of a no harm, no foul situation. I felt like the hardest thing was just not having sort of the visual cues and reactions from people that you would normally have in an in-person defense. Mm-hmm. So you're talking, you don't get people kind of nodding or whatever. And the other thing I want to mention with respect to what was the same or different from an in-person versus virtual is I felt like the intellectual engagement of my committee was not necessarily affected. I felt like I got just as high quality feedback as if it had been in person. So that was something uh, interesting, I guess, or surprising. So Yeah, that's um, that's great to hear. And you know, I've attended a couple um, PhD defenses via Zoom that were these more sort of science public final presentations. And that was something I was concerned about too, but I was really impressed at the number of questions and how engaged a number of people in the audience must have been to ask those questions. So uh, I'm glad you yeah. had that experience as well. One of the reasons that I wanted to reach out to you specifically was, I mean, certainly as a graduate student who was sort of on the front edge of doing these defenses by Zoom, I was thinking as you were describing, you know, your interaction with your faculty committee doing your defense, you said this was the 24th or so of March. That was before having Zoom meetings was a daily part of our life too. So probably everyone was still getting used to that idea. But one of the reasons we wanted to reach out is you went one step beyond just completing your defense via Zoom, and and you put together this really thorough and really awesome document. It's currently on Google Doc um, called Defending a Dissertation by Video Conference. And you go through in detail a lot of really practical suggestions for setting up a video conference and just some other things that a graduate student might think about 
as they are moving towards doing their own defense on Zoom. So we're going to get into that a little bit, and we're certainly going to post a link to your document on the show notes because I think it's really helpful for anyone who's getting ready to defend virtually. But what prompted you to put this document together? It's obviously not something you had to do, um, but why did you do this? I think I've accepted that this is my contribution to the literature. I think more people have read this document than probably anything I have ever written or will ever write. <laughs> I, will, I will say right now, so you wrote this document, what, like two weeks ago, three weeks ago now? Yeah, something like that. Well, as I'm looking, I have it open right now on my, my screen, and there are over 20 people who are currently viewing this document <laughs> right now. Yeah, I ever since the Inside Higher Ed article ran, I've never opened this document and had fewer than 10 people looking at it at any given time which is insane. But so what, what compels me to write this document? I, I think different people have different reactions to stress and uncertainty or anxiety. And my response is to sort of really focus on things I can control. And so this was a way for me to kind of channel a lot of anxiety about the sort of changing situation, especially around dissertation defenses, but broadly about higher education into something that I could manage. And so that was, I think, where, so this, I turned all of this energy into this document. Um, and I also, I, I love and respect my committee, but I knew that they needed some pretty explicit guidance, again, because this was still pretty early days into our uh, Zoom future, or rather present. And so I looked online and there wasn't really anything out there that was already made that was sort of addressed to them. Um, so there's a lot of stuff for like candidates who have to do Skype interviews or if you're working from home and you need to do a meeting, but it wasn't something that was specifically for dissertation defenses that was specifically for committee members. And so that was sort of the, the logic was that, and I had to, and I thought once I made it, I thought, well, I made this for them, but I might as well make this useful for other people who may, whose response to stress may be, I can't do anything. I'm you know, just watching Netflix or on <laughs> social media to distract myself. And so maybe they don't have the energy to make a document like this and I can make that useful for them. So I also, again, knew there were lots of people in my department who were going to be doing this in the next few weeks. So at minimum, I thought, well, maybe my department can use it. So I didn't anticipate it to be, you know, to get emails from directors of grad studies at institutions across the country saying, hey, is it okay if we use this document? <laughs> Well, yeah, well, you know, I'm hoping through through this interview today, I mean, I know we have listeners not just all across the United States, but all across the world who might find this really helpful. So thank you for taking the time to put this together. First of all, I think the more we can share ideas, it benefits everyone. So I think this is really great. Like I said, we're going to link this the full document in the show notes for people who want to read it in its entirety. But how about you just walk us through the maybe three to five things that graduate students should think about when they're preparing to defend digitally. And, and, you know, these can be very practical things, but now that you've gone through the process um, and you've got this time of people who are listening to you on the podcast right now, maybe getting ready to do their own defense, what are some top tips that you would give to them? So the first is that I think I started this document thinking that I was going to prevent things from going wrong. And by the time I finished it, I realized this was really about making a plan for what I would do when things went wrong, so when somebody's connection drops or when someone forgets to mute their microphone. Um, so I think that's really crucial is just being okay with the chaos associated with this format. Another thing is that, like I said before, everything right now feels incredibly uncertain, which can be really anxiety inducing. But I think this is one of the few things that you can exert some control over. You know, it's your, at the end of the day, it's your defense. So you can sort of set the rules. You can control how you, you know, how you even arrange your own space, where you're going to defend. So I sat at my dining room table, which is not typically, as you saw, I was not sitting, I'm not sitting at my dining room table now. It's not where I work, <laughs> but it felt like the kind of seminar table that I would have sat at in an in-person defense. So I think just recognizing that you can make demands of people through this process um, and be okay with that. I think this is more obvious for people in the sciences who have to give presentations, but definitely just take, don't forget to 
practice, uh, just like you would practice for a conference presentation or any other kind of public presentation. Just because it's happening through your computer screen doesn't mean you don't need to prepare for it. And the last one, which I'm still, I think, as I mentioned earlier, still working through, which is just acknowledge to yourself the fact that you're doing it digitally doesn't make it less real or doesn't make it less of an accomplishment. You know, you're getting the same PhD that you would have gotten with an in-person defense. So I'm, I'll admit, I'm actually still coming to terms with that, I think. And so you're saying that, you know, even part of you feels like you've, def- you know, you successfully defended your thesis with your committee, just like you would have done, but there's a little sort of nagging feeling of, well, but I didn't really do it or, or something like that, or I didn't a hundred percent do it. Like you might've felt if you were, had done it the traditional way. Yeah. And I, I think that's completely fictional. Like it's completely in my head and I know that, but yeah, it took me longer to sort of change, you know, do things like change my email signature or something because like, well, uh, and maybe it'll be more real once I turn in the revised, you know, really file it in progress and all that do the paperwork, I guess. So you mentioned practicing and obviously I think you know, that's a, a great idea and especially practicing in the specific way that you're going to be presenting via Zoom, which is going to be very different than how you would have presented maybe in a conference room or in a lecture hall. How much thought and effort did you put into, and I know part of your document is about this, thinking about the background and the camera placement and the lighting and did, did you spend time thinking about setting up how it would look um, on the video, maybe more than you would if you were just having a casual meeting uh, with someone this week that had less significance than a dissertation. Yeah. And I think part of it was not so much about the look of like looking professional or looking good. I actually spent less time thinking about my outfit because I couldn't go shopping. So, um, (laughs) you know, I, I had all these grand plans to like go to South Point and like go shopping, but I think it was less about the look necessarily than being comfortable and being confident in the space. And so um, part of that's like, I have an X, you know, having an external keyboard, which I already had an external keyboard. So I'm not having to lean into the screen if I need to type some setting myself up to where I don't feel like I'm fumbling to do things or to make eye contact with the camera. Yeah. I think for me, it was about feeling comfortable. Is there anything you would have done differently or anything you would change about how it went that you had control over? There are really only two things. One was I probably should have actually done it in here in this office space that I'm in right now because it's closer to our wireless router. (laughs) (laughs) So you had some latency issues. My connection kind of was iffy um, for part of it. The other thing is, and this is very simple, but that you asked what I would change. And this is what I would change, which is I read, I had notes for my introduction that I give, which is a very brief introduction. Um, but I didn't arrange my screen in a way that I could read the notes and see my committee members' reactions. And so I, it was almost this, this feeling of like, if you were reading notes and you had a piece of paper in front of your face mm, yeah. so that you couldn't see anyone who was hearing the note, hearing the speech. It was a very weird feeling, Um, but it was, I had already started talking and it was too late for me to kind of rearrange or or to stop. So some thought about how I was going to do that beforehand. Yeah, that's good advice. Any, any last minute advice you have for, for our listeners, for grad students who are listening right now and thinking about getting ready to defend or just advice to people trying to go through it and do their grad student life right now? I think we were talking about this at the beginning a little bit, but one thing that I kind of hope comes out of this is that we all, not just grad students, but maybe especially grad students and people in academia, take this extraordinary circumstance to really think through what's important and what about our culture of work and productivity is good and what about it maybe uh, should change. What you know, figuring out like what matters to to us. So I think there's lots of lots of elements of grad school culture that can be pretty toxic or demoralizing. You know, if you're so focused on productivity or meeting other people's expectations, you can really like put off your life. And I think this has brought that into focus for a lot of people. So I think realize figuring out like why you're doing this, why you're in grad school. It just doesn't just to concretize this a little bit. I've been working Saturdays for the last like three years 
not every Saturday, but I definitely work on Saturday as like a normal thing. Mm -hmm. But since this started, and it's also partly because I have less to do, but since this started, I've just been like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm going to actually observe the weekend. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it's not even really because I don't want to work on Saturday. It's just because if I don't do Saturdays, then we don't even keep, we have no idea how time is passing. (laughs) So I think that was, that's been something And I think more broadly, I think it's just way too early to know how this is going to affect higher education. I think that there's going to be some profound changes in higher education, but I I think there's a lot of effort right now to kind of like predict what's going to happen. And I just think it's, I think it's just too soon to know. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And I think we were all caught off guard just by how rapidly everything completely changed uh, in the world broadly, but even in our sphere of, of academia how quickly labs were shut down and graduate students were, were sent home. And I love the sentiment that you have and these thoughts you have, you know, I hope are true. I think you're totally right that this might be a forced way to think about and prioritize what work is required and what are some things we were doing, some habits we had in academia that weren't, not only weren't healthy, but also weren't necessarily contributing to the end goal of of knowledge or the work that we had to do. And, and then why were we doing those in the first place? And maybe if there's any silver lining, it'll, I think that reevaluation of our work habits could hopefully be a, an outcome of this. I think that's a great sentiment. And thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. And I think it's just, this. Ha- I mean, this happens too often outside of these contexts as people don't take care of themselves while they're, you know, you're, you get so focused on, trying to get that article out of publication or trying to get tenure or trying to finish your dissertation that you like lose sight of, you know, basic health issues. Like I said, I think my biggest takeaway from, from where I am at right now is just this strong sense that, you know, we're going to see some major changes that we cannot predict, but it's also too soon to know what those changes are going to be. So along those lines, I'll ask you (laughs) a completely hilarious final question, which is what's next for you? What, um, how is this, I'm sure, you know, even through thinking about this, that maybe this has injected a little extra uncertainty into you as you finish up this chapter of your life, but um, what's on tap for your next steps? Yeah, so I think you mentioned this in a previous episode, so I will mention this, which is I've been playing a lot of Animal Crossing lately. Oh, good. I'm not the only one. Dan, will he makes fun of me all the time, like I'm the only one doing this. No, no, no. I feel extraordinarily lucky um, in that I actually... Oh, got one of the postdocs I applied for. I So I will be teaching at Duke Kunshan University. I may be teaching there from the comfort of my home in Durham, but um, nevertheless, I have somewhere to land in the fall, which is, I think, more than a lot of people can say right now. So I'm very grateful for that. But long-term, there's still, I think, a lot of uncertainty for me, um, especially because I'm looking at academic as well as non-academic jobs. I'm a real advocate of PhDs, in the humanities pursuing non-academic careers, but the looming prospect of an economic recession does not make me very optimistic about that job search. I think for me, it's, there's a lot of unknowns, but I think, you know, only time will tell on a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. We we are advocates for academics doing non-academic careers as well, by the way. (laughs) I assume so. I thought I would just out there as like, my positionality on the subject. Yeah. Well, Ashton, best of luck to you. And, and thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me and to share your insights and this amazing document with our audience. And how can, yeah. how can people find you online? So I'm on Twitter as uh, at AW Merck. And then I'm also findable through email. Thanks so much, Ashton. It was great talking to you. Thank you so much, uh, Josh. All right, Dan, that was my conversation with Ashton. Josh, is it terrible that my first thought when listening to that was, what a great way when you get that really hard question from your committee to be able to like, you know, uh, so Mr. Arneman, did you consider Titus et al.'s 1938 paper? Um, yes. I really, I, that was a, a very important study. <laughs> and uh, yes, yes, yeah, that was, I could just, I just have this feeling I would be tempted to try and look things up. I need a very quiet keyboard. Is that sort of like cheating during trivia? 
you could always go with the oh i'm sorry the my internet connection is really spazzing this out is where your of skill of faking um cell phone service garbage really comes in <laughs> i'm sorry you know one of the things i had really wanted to, to ask her about and, and was glad she spoke about was well, not just the practical differences to giving a thesis defense via via Zoom versus in person, but really, as I alluded to before the interview, this kind of emotional change, because even as Ashton mentioned, this all changed in a matter of a week or two. She had her in-person defense scheduled, and within a week or two later, you know, the format completely changed. But not only that, I guess all of these departmental norms or these social these social rites of passage that you look forward to, you know, celebrating with your friends and your colleagues in the department, those go completely out the window. And I don't know if you can remember those times, Dan, not just the act of doing your dissertation defense, but, you know, at least in our field, it was, it was very common to invite your family and then your friends come and then you all. Yeah. My parents were there. I mean, we had champagne Um, with my PI. It was a, it was a memorable experience. Yeah. I've had some extra time for housework these last few weeks and I was, cleaning out some boxes, I actually found some photos from my thesis defense. And I found one of you and I from immediately following my, uh, my defense. I should, maybe I I'll can't post remember. That. Did I cut, did you have a public defense? Did I come to the actual defense or did I just come for the party? Dan, I have, no, I must have, I have photo asleep. evidence, Dan. I'm actually going to, I'm going to start my video back up. I'm going to show you this. Uh, do you see that? We look exactly the same. You did great, Josh. I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, me too. Me too. All right, Dan, what what else jumped out at you? What do you want to talk about? Well, I think some of this? the recommendations that she gives in the document, which, as you mentioned in the, in the interview, was very popular. People are still looking at it. It's a Monday night, quite late, and there are plenty of people still viewing the document. So uh, she definitely found the need. But uh, I think just some of the tips in here would be helpful for people at my office or people doing any kind of video conferencing. She's talking about how to set it up so that it feels very fluid, so the the lighting is good, so that you don't look like you're living in a dark cave. You know, if we could get everybody on a Zoom call to mute themselves. and But she gives advice in different sections for mm, the yes. faculty that are attending that, you know, they can just read this one little section and know how to behave on this very new social interaction that we're all just getting used to. So I think it's it's really targeted, and there's a lot of subtle details that each person can appreciate for their role in the dissertation defense. And I think to some degree, probably graduate students who are defending now or in the next in the coming weeks and months might have some advantage to someone like Ashton, who really was on the front lines of of doing this. Because when you say, I would say all of our Zoom etiquette and Zoom expertise has certainly improved <laughs> over the last few weeks. Would you say? I hope so. One one thing I would recommend, though, if you're a grad student who has a defense that's coming up, or even if it's not a defense, let's say you have a presentation to give for your department or some other type of research talk, and it's looking like it's going to be given virtually instead of in person. I can remember, Dan, when I got married. This was quite a while ago. And we had several friends who were also getting married during the summer that that we got married. And we went to a couple of these weddings that happened before our wedding. And it was very insightful to kind of take notes and see things that you liked and didn't like about these other weddings and make some adjustments to your own. I think it's very similar with these thesis defenses. If you've got a thesis defense or a talk to give coming up, if you have the opportunity to attend someone else's thesis defense, by all means, do that. And it's a great way to kind of take some notes and see how it works from the audience member's perspective and things that that presenter did really well, things that they maybe could have done differently uh, versus just going into it cold the first time when it's your turn to present. Uh, seek out these opportunities to, to watch someone That's else really do good it first. advice. And can. I think it's a, a special opportunity right now for you to go to somebody else's real world physical defense. You'd have to know somebody in your department who is graduating read about it on the flyer or find out about it and then go sit there for an hour with this you could go on twitter and see somebody across the country or around the world do their defense you could probably watch two or three of these without um leave obviously without leaving your your computer screen and so this is a really great opportunity to do just what you said get the experience through somebody else's experience and it's a great way to support other grad students who are going through this difficult time i'll say dan 
like I mentioned, I've sat in, I think, on three of these defenses now over the last few weeks. And I was a little skeptical at first going into it that I was going to be as engaged as maybe I would have been sitting through a talk normally. But I actually thought it was fairly effective, you know, doing the the screen share. And (laughs) first of all, I think being able to just be really comfortable <laughs> and in my pajamas <laughs> kind of watching this this research talk and you know you can see well you're not in the back of the room and you can hear okay uh, I have got my coffee with me I found personally I didn't lose a whole lot of engagement compared to sitting in a lecture hall full of people I think to some regard there were some advantages to at least from an audience member taking in a talk that way versus It'd be pretty cool the traditional way. If your collaborators could also be at your defense. I know we collaborated with people in Europe and other places around the world. How amazing would it be if instead of buying a plane ticket and trying to sit there for an hour and then going home, they could just tune in? I, I think it would it would give you access to research that is not published. It would give you access to somebody's dissertation, which is it is a crafted. Um, piece of science, but it is not necessarily a published piece of science. And so it's, it seems like a really unique opportunity to me to get access to research that is just happening. Absolutely true. And another thing that, that jumped out at me that I thought was kind of neat, this is a small thing, but as soon as the presentation was over for these grad students and they were done with their defense, immediately the chat functionality just erupted with all of these congratulatory messages and sort of well done, way to go, we're going to miss you. I don't know, it was just all of this immediate positive affirmation um, through the chat. And that's not, not something you would normally get during a traditional yeah, thesis great. defense. You know, I will say, Dan, one thing that has changed a little bit from the early days, the early days being two weeks ago versus now, is there's been a lot of high profile incidences of this Zoom bombing or, you know, I think sort of in in the early days, what I saw a lot of grad students doing was they would just send out their link saying, hey, check out my thesis defense, here's the link. And I actually know of a couple of people who either were teaching a class or doing a thesis uh, defense and suddenly some unwanted attention, uh, someone broke into their, their Zoom meeting, was posting a lot of vitriol, and that was kind of uncomfortable. So I think what a lot of in- universities are doing, I know my own university who has a Zoom license, it's now mandatory that you have a password on your on your Zoom meeting. So I think that adds one small barrier to just blanket sending it out. But if your situation is not where a password is required, it's something you might consider doing either generating a password or or activating the wait room functionality where people who click through the link aren't automatically added into the, the chat, but they have to go through a waiting room um, and then they're admitted. One thing you might want to do, though, when you're presenting is maybe get a friend or a colleague to be the co-host of your room. I think you can you can deem someone a co-host and have them kind of let people in since you'll be busy um, getting ready for your talk and giving your talk. I think Ashton has added an addendum as of the end of last month uh, to kind of handle some of the things you were talking about with the crashing and the bombing. And, and she talks about exactly what, what you mentioned, Josh, the waiting room, um, turning off the setting that allows removed people to rejoin and uh, there's lots of great content in there. We're going to link to that. My favorite one is under the additional best practices for the committee, number eight. If you have a cat or dog, the committee must see it at least once. So that seemed like a good addition. I think that is a great way to get some positive vibes and some some sympathy and empathy from your committee is to show off your cute dog or cat. Or toddler. Or toddler running into the room. It happens. Um, you know, Dan, the last thing I wanted to mention was at the end, our conversation uh, meandered a bit to to this idea that the way that we do work in academia, and really not just academia, has very quickly and fundamentally changed over the last few weeks with most of us leaving the lab and working from home and, and rethinking our own productivity and prioritization. And, you know, one of the things Ashton mentioned was, is it possible that these really radical changes we've been forced to do might actually have us reevaluate some of our work habits that we have in academia once things return back to normal. And I think that's a really fascinating question to think about 
you know, is there a silver lining? Are there some important lessons that we can learn about our own sort of habits and our own work styles uh, for the future? And I think that would be a topic worth exploring on a future episode. Well, if people hear that call and have ideas, they can send them to podcast at Hello PhD, or they can tweet them to us at Hello PhD. We love uh, feedback. We love commentary. So I guess the call is for ways that you hope your research or your training will change after the pandemic is over. And you could go back to the way you used to do it, but you don't feel that that, that was as good as what it could be now. Yeah. Is there anything you're learning from this period of time that you might carry with you when, when things return to normal? All right, Josh. Well, let's wrap it up. Let everybody get back to their uh, quarantines. You know, if you like the show, you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We do love the feedback. You can become a patron. You just go to our website, hellophd.com, and click on the Become a Patron button or visit patreon.com slash hellophd. Uh, we would appreciate the beer money or boxed wine money. And thank you to the ongoing support from our patrons. All right, Dan. Well, I feel like we should start renumbering our episodes. This is episode two of the the pandemic files. The pandemic We're going to have BCE, CE, and during the pandemic, we're just going <laughs> to rename the entire epic. I think I think we're hitting our stride, Dan. We'll see we'll see how long this goes. Uh, I apologize for last week's audio snafu, uh, as I did at the end of the last episode. This time, I think I recorded the whole thing on my side, so we'll see how it goes. We will find out. I will find out <laughs> when I edit this. <laughs> you'll be the first to know. <laughs> That's right. If you hear just t- Josh talking to himself, you'll know that this didn't work at all. And for our Patreon bonus content, you get to hear what Dan said also. <laughs> all right, Josh, we'll stay safe and we'll see you next time. All right, Dan, we'll see you next time.